the most important samples we take during the health assessments is, is a blood sample. And I only put one word up there, which is blood. Um, we do uh, highly value it, and it can go in many different directions. We always run the basic blood work, the CDC and serum chemistry. But this is where, from a research standpoint, it's really important to understand what questions are we trying to answer with the health assessment. Are we running cortisol and aldosterone and APTH? Or are we running serology to look for tires to certain infectious diseases? So what questions are we trying to answer? And then we always send a bank, because you never know what questions are going to come up 10 years later. Um, biological samples, so fecal, urine, gastric samples, global samples, anything coming out of the animal or inside of the animal that you could easily get access to relatively non-invasively can teach you about what's happening with that animal and that animal's health. So we always try to really do the same thing and structure our sampling protocols so we can answer the questions that we're trying to address um, because every little bit of data will help you paint that picture. And then you get into targeted sampling. So when you found something on your physical exam, then what additional sampling needs to take place? This, um, for, this picture is a bone marrow biopsy um, that's happening with one of our vets and an orthopedic surgeon because they found this a, a bone lesion that they wanted to put a needle in, into. So we're often talking about needles and where we want to stick them and what kinds of samples we want to get. Um, but these targeted samples will then take you to that next step of, okay, there is something wrong either with the animal or the population, and how can we better get a diagnosis on exactly what that problem is? Um, and then some of the more still pretty basic, um, but not as often done, um, ECGs, uh, which are important, and, and in this photo, um, this is a dolphin in a, in a makeshift hospital, and you can see the suction cups on the animal, which are actually EKG and electrodes. So modified for the patient um, to allow it to easily stick to the animal. There's no needles, there's no clips, um, so the animal doesn't really sense that the suction cups are there, but we're able to get an EKG tracing, and that also is giving you a little bit more information, not necessarily about the heart itself, but about electrolyte abnormalities um, and about the animal's health in general. Hearing tests, so um, what they're talking about downstairs. Um, and so, but hearing tests are part of the animal's overall health. So what can we do to better understand um, the hearing? And this has become extremely important, um, most recently for those of you um, that are part of the NIMS and NOAA team. Um, prior to releasing a stranded animal, what is the hearing capability of that animal specifically um, cetaceans, and are they able to be released back into the wild? Are there hearing capabilities there, and will that allow them to survive? Ultrasound, um, so I am a huge fan of ultrasound. Um, those of you that know me know that um, I pretty much don't go anywhere without an ultrasound machine. Um, it's, it allows you to have a periscope basically inside the animal, so even when you're, especially when you're in a in a situation where you need to quickly evaluate an animal's health, an ultrasound image is something you can obtain a huge amount of information in five minutes where your blood sample might still be cooking, and so you won't even know yet from your blood sample what's happening. We have several field-ready options, um, and so uh, that's one of our setups on the bottom left, and so we're able to take these systems into the field on the boats and really get a nice, um, snapshot of what's happening inside the body quickly. Examples of that are um, reproductive evaluations. So on the bottom left, there's um, a, a fetus here. You can see the skull. Hopefully you can see the skull. Um, the, the chest is here, the vertebral. Oh, I just lost my pointer. But um, you can just start to see the, um, the backbone. And then the rostrum is actually pointing out. It's like a little bird's beak. Um, so we can look quickly and see, is the animal pregnant? Is she not the safe um, cycling? Is she at? Is she early pregnant? What's the fetal health or the fetal abnormalities? And if it's a catch, capture and release event, then the biologist can track, with, was she seen exactly, we can get an estimated due date, was she seen X number of months later with or without a calf? So you can look at reproductive success in that population if you look at ultrasound of, um, of the reproductive tract as well. So. That's one example of what you can see on the inside. General organ health, blood flow, it's all kinds of things that um, you can look at. This is an example of a kidney. We're just turning Doppler on, which allows you to look at blood flow. 
So the colors are showing the blood flow pattern within the kidney. And then we're do, able to do some more measurements to look at resistive indexes, make it a little bit more sophisticated. Um, but basically, you can do that with just about any organ in the body. Um, and then we can guide sampling with ultrasound. So now we found something, something's wrong. On the left, you see completely normal lung, and I won't get into why that is normal. But you can see that's different from the, all the image on the right. There's a black band with a bright white dot in the middle, and that dot is the tip of the needle that's actually now in the cavity around the lungs that's taking a sample of the fluid, because by getting a sample of that fluid, which shouldn't be there, we're going to be able to figure out what kind of fluid that is and potentially why the animal has, in this case, what's called pleural fusion, which is fluid around the lungs. So um, ultrasound can not just look inside and help us find out what's wrong, but then guide the sampling to be able to figure out exactly why that disease process has begun and, and at what stage it's at. X-rays, so we're going to start to get a little bit away from the field, and I'll quickly go through these because they're not as field applicable. Um, but X-rays, another way to look inside the body, great for bone, great for lungs, um, great for traumatic injuries, of course, um, human interactions, they're good for documenting specific things. Um, but again, looking inside, even a little bit further away from the field, but still applicable to stranded marine mammals for sure, um, both small cetaceans and pinnipeds, um, CT exams. So getting a full body CT scan to really go searching for exactly what's going on with the animal. We've worked out protocols as a veterinary um, community. We've worked out protocols for being able to do this safely on live animals. The top is just a slice through the animal's chest, an actual slice, a CT slice, through the animal's chest, so the dark areas are the lungs, the lung fields. The bottom is just a 3D reconstruction of all of the CT data that was captured in about three minutes. Time, very quickly captured and then reconstructed so you can see the blue lungs that are um, highlighted just, just under the background. Um, and then just more of that um, on the right, there's um, you can see uh, a cross section of the animal again, another 3D reconstruction, and we're studying stone disease in this case. So the clusters um, are stones that are kidney stones, so we can uh, study this disease and track it. This is a case of Brucella. Um, vertebral osteomyelitis or spondylosis, and the arrows are pointing to where vertebral bodies have fused. Again, that was data we collected on a CT and reconstructed. Um, we would not have known that otherwise. You can also do reconstruction um, and start to fly through certain organs if you have a CT slice capability. So this was reconstructed from a CT set um, through a dolphin's chest, and now we're flying through the airways. And so you would be able to identify lesions that were in the airways by doing this, where otherwise you wouldn't be able to see, see inside the lungs unless you took a bronchoscope and actually placed it there. And then bronchoscopy, of course, itself um, could also be performed. And then finally, nuclear medicine, which is um, really very much more specific. That would be uh, more applicable if you were trying to answer a question or really look at an individual animal disease process. In this example, we were studying renal function in a single animal, um, or sorry, a group of animals. On the left, you see these two blobs. Those are the two kidneys, and each image represents um, a series and a 30-second capture of a radioisotope that was taken up by the kidneys and then excreted through the kidneys. And so that radioisotope which is called MAG3, is specific for the kidneys. So if you go to the kidneys, both kidneys should take it up, so both of those blobs should be equal, and then it will start to be excreted out of the animal's body. So on the right, you can see the blobs aren't equal, the kidney uptake is not equal, and in fact, we're missing part of the kidney uptake on the, on the right side. So we can look at function, not just structure. And that's really the bottom line, is this is just one example of how we can look at the function of the organs, not just the structure. And again, this is getting pretty far away from the field, but still applicable um, to the way we evaluate their health and the way that you can evaluate an individual animal's health and then extrapolate it back to a population. And then finally, MRI. And this is um, the Marine Mammal Center has done an amazing job leading the way and looking at um, the effects of doing well acid on sea lions. Um, this is a dolphin, of course. Um, but MRI is becoming increasingly important for things like toxin exposures and what impact does that have 
um, with pneumonic acid, specifically on um, on neural function and neural structure. Um, then you can even layer on nuclear medicine, um, much like we looked at just for the kidneys. You can layer on nuclear medicine effects and then look at function in addition to structure. So there's a lot of possibilities um, uh, for looking at the animals with different modalities. And really the bottom line and what I hope I was able to demonstrate is that we're able to do pretty much anything that is currently being done in veterinary, veterinary medicine and applying it to a large number of marine mammal species. There are limitations based on size and anesthesia um, and aggression and all kinds of other things that we can deal with, um, but some of the obstacles are, are more difficult to overcome. Um, but we certainly have, as a veterinary community, really tried to tackle these issues to provide ourselves as well as the research community with tools for evaluating their health. So just to bring it back um, to the animals and how the animals really are an integral part of the overall ocean health, um, and hopefully I was able to give you a sense of, from our perspective, um, how we do that on an individual animal level and what can be done. And if you um, consult with any one of us, like I said, we'd be happy to go into more detail about the specific tests. So, um, Stephanie, you want me to um, answer yeah, questions there, now? Yeah, if there were um, specific questions about how, maybe one thing that might be useful is of those, how many have you, what have you used in wild uh, life marine mammal assessment? Um, so we've been fortunate to be collaborating with um, Chicago Zoological Society, the Sarasota Dolphin Research Project, um, and National Marine Fisheries on uh, wild dolphin health assessments. We've been able to apply um, almost everything, pretty much once you got to CT, not then, <laughs> CT and up. Um, of course, we can't do that in the field, we've, but pretty much everything else you can. So the complete physical exam, blood work, cytology, um, urine samples, fecal samples, gastric samples, um, ultrasound is a big part of it. Uh, there is um, tooth aging that's done um, in those animals as well. Um, X-ray is being discussed um, for future events. Um, and then there's always a wide range of additional things that are happening, hearing tests. I mean, it just depends on the questions that are being asked um, at that time. And then a lot of things that are archived as well. So again, a lot can be, and all of that is done in about um, 45 minutes to an hour's time. So it doesn't take a lot of time to get a lot done. And then there's, you know, greens of data that um, can be evaluated and a lot of things archived. So the animal can then be released back to the wild, um, but that data used to extrapolate the population. Yes? Have you ever done biopsies that looked at uh, pollutants in their tissues? Yes, and so, sorry, I left that out, and that's an important one um, that, yes, that has been, and that's less for um, for a veterinary medical assessment, but absolutely for um, research studies into toxin um, contaminant exposure. Um, that is routinely done. Um, so there's different sizes you could just do, uh, you know, we've done tiny little um, biopsies as well as large biopsies, wedge biopsies, just depending on how much tissue is needed for the test. Hormone testing can also be done in blubber samples, um, tissue samples. So, and then we're also talking about, although this is a little bit more aggressive, that when you do actually see a lesion inside an organ, should you go ahead and try to get a diagnosis and, and get a biopsy of that. And so we're starting to feel much more comfortable with those procedures <coughs> in marine mammals. So we're recommending that, yes, you should go ahead and, and sample when you see that there is something wrong. Yes, Francis. I know you got the trouble with your ultrasound, so I was wondering if you had um, ideas or had looked at technology for remote ultrasound, so for example on a, on a free-swimming baby whale, or even a small free-swimming adult, but right. you haven't got your hands on. No, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, you know, so are you talking about an extension of what um, the original Michael Morris work with the blubber yeah, ultrasound? Yeah, something with a, to a cell phone connection, or or some ilk, or just something yeah, that, that you can get that image of something that you are right. as separated as we are right now. Yeah, yeah, that would be really interesting. I think if it, it could be as simple as a pole with a transducer with a long enough cord, um, and then it would just have to be, you know, part of the art of ultrasound is, is, is the more still the animal is, the better <laughs> image you're going to get. So now you're moving and everything, you know, so, you know, we've all gotten really good at water's moving, everything's moving, still able to get a good image. But for the 
the most part, the animal's not moving that much. So that would add an, um, another challenge, not just to the technology adaptation that is doable, for sure, but um, that would just have to be something that you would have to um, get really good at um, looking at images that, that were moving and be able to understand them. There are, um, kind of in the same vein, there are technologies now um, that where they're looking at uh, having an ultrasonographer somewhere very far away from you, or a radiologist states away, but able to see exactly what you're doing live ultrasound scanning. Um, so you have a radiologist basically in your ear so that you can be scanning. You have to sit on the way. So there are some of those, like tell, it's not quite teleradiology, but have the radiologist with you, although not really, with you in spirit and with you in opinion, um, so that they can be helping to guide your scan. If it was someone that was not quite as experienced, um, or a radiologist themselves, which I am not. So yeah, great question. Yes? One of the new sampling techniques that we're doing on stranded animals is sampling gas bubbles or gas emboli. Would uh, ultrasound be useful for locating and sampling those? Yes, it would. So gas, I mean, it, it's a little bit tricky because gas, um, you can identify gas bubbles, and Sophie Dennison has done a really nice job of showing that with ultrasound. Um, it, they usually create um, a little bit of a shadow, uh, so it's a little bit dirty in terms of figuring out, um, exact, you know, be able to pinpoint it exactly, but it's doable. Um, so yes, I think that you could use ultrasound to guide sampling if you weren't going to actually, well, even if you were going to open the animal and then use ultrasound to actually figure out exactly where in the organ. Yeah, so I think that's doable. How I much? haven't done that myself specifically. Around how much would an ultrasound cost to do that kind of sampling? Yeah, the ultrasound, depending on whether you get a new or a refurbished, the machines that we are typically using that have enough power to get through the blubber layer, because a lot of times that, that it's not an insignificant thing. Um, the range I would say for used is starting maybe around 15, 20,000, going up to about 75,000 dollars. They're not cheap. They do last, and there's, you know, in my opinion, is such an important tool um, for us to have. Um, and again, and understanding the limitations of the species is important first. To really make sure that you can actually, you know, some of the large whales, you, it's only at a 30 centimeter right. depth. So where are you at once you're 30 centimeters in? Can you get any diagnostic information from that? I think what we'll do is um, hold the... No, Francis. <laughs> <laughs> what we'll do is hold the rest of the questions for discussion, but please keep them fresh on your mind because this is...